Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Electrical Systems Designing Electrical Rooms, sponsored by ASCO Power Technologies. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with the Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power and CFE Media. For those of you who are interested in receiving a learning unit for this e event, you need to pass a 10-question exam to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window and you can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the on-demand version of the webcast. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system policy, please take a few moments to read the quality assurance slide. And please note, it is the responsibility of the attendee to contact any state licensing boards or accrediting bodies to ensure this online event is eligible for continuing education credits. Here is a list of the learning unit objectives for today's event. And we'll cover these in today's presentation. Today's presenters today uh, are both members of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Mario Vecarello is Regional Operations Manager at CDM Smith responsible for the consulting and engineering services throughout the eastern United States. He leads a large interdisciplinary and diverse team that works on a variety of traditional and non-traditional projects in the environmental, industrial, institutional, and federal markets. Richard Vedvik is with IMEG Corp, where he has experience in the healthcare, education, commercial, and government sectors. His electrical engineering experience includes lighting, design, power distribution, emergency power systems, and fire alarm systems. He was a 2015 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner. And thank you, Mario and Rich, for joining us today. And Rich, you're our first speaker. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Jack. Today's presentation is going to be discussing electrical rooms, and of course, we must start with applicable codes. The National Fire Protection Association, abbreviated as NFPA, has Section 70, which is the National Electric Code. It has several sections that impact our electrical room requirements. And some of these main sections include 110, which is the requirements for electrical installations. You'll see several references to that section here. Section 450, which is transformers and transformer vaults, includes references for fire ratings. Section 517 is healthcare facilities, and it defines emergency branches for healthcare. Section 700 is emergency systems, and it identifies electrical distribution requirements for all other buildings. NFPA Section 99, which is the Healthcare Facilities Code, includes requirements for rooms containing emergency power systems. And obviously, since that applies primarily to healthcare facilities, it isn't necessarily applicable to all other installations. NFPA Section 101 is the Life Safety Code. And some of the references you'll see within this presentation address exit passageways and egress requirements. Section 110 is the standard for emergency and standby power systems. And Chapter 7 of that section is the installation and environmental considerations. Lastly, we have building codes from IBC, which is the International Building Code, and UBC, the Uniform Building Code, that also identify panic hardware requirements and will affect room ratings based on occupancies. And Mario is next. As Mario is probably discussing, NEC Section 110.26.2. Yes. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Rich. Uh, with, um, I'm going to talk a little bit here about how we coordinate uh, electrical uh, installations with a number of different disciplines. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk here about is how we coordinate with uh, architectural. Uh, sections uh, 110.26 and 110.33 uh, 
Uh, Section 110.26 actually talks about the egress and access to uh, the electrical spaces. Uh, 110.26c uh, says you have to have an adequate uh, space to egress and enter the electrical space. Uh, and so the minimum requirement is sufficient area that is needed for that, for that space. However, we're going to talk a little bit about how that affects the size of the electrical room. Uh, there are two other sections to uh, section 110.26c2 and 110.33a1. Uh, this 110.26 is for equipment that is uh, less than 1,000 volts, and 110.33 is uh, for equipment greater than 1,000 volts. Uh, if you look at uh, Article uh, 110.26c2, that's for equipment that is rated over 100, 1,200 amps and more than six feet wide. It requires that we have two entrances to the, the electrical space. Uh, to the impact on the build, this could have significant impact on the electrical room size because you need to be able to get in and out of the electrical space from both sides. Uh, the electrical room egress and entrance, there's also Article 11026C2 and 11033A1. There are exceptions that allow you only one entrance and egress with obstruct, unobstructed egress. This could have significant impact on the size of your room because uh, you may have to have a lot more space in front of the equipment and you may find in an existing facility that you're unable to fit the equipment in the room and still have uh, adequate egress to uh, egress the electrical space. And as we move down into the code sections 110.26C2 and 110.33A1, but also is a, uh, there also is an allowance in there where if we have extra workspace, for instance, if we double the workspace uh, between the 1200 amp equipment face to face with two times the workspace, and we make sure that there's a minimum distance uh, based on table 11026A or 11033A for equipment above 1000, 1000 volts, they're allowed to have one, one egress spot that exits the work, minimum workspace. So you can see as, depending on the size of the equipment and the type of equipment that you're installing in these rooms, you may, may have require a much larger space than you originally anticipate. So you need to make sure that you understand uh, that there are, that large equipment uh, may result in a much larger uh, size room because of the space and cl clearances that you need from uh, in front of the equipment and to get to the egress space. And I'm going to move on to uh, the working clearances that uh, are going to uh, send us over to Rich. Thank you, Mario. As mentioned in the previous slides, working clearances can be found in NEC articles 1026 and 1031. When we're looking at requirements for clearances, NEC references and identifies the operating voltages to ground, not line to line. And that's important for designers and engineers and also facilities to understand that. For low voltage systems under 50 volts, there is an exception with AHU approval, AHJ approval, I should say. So the authority having jurisdiction can approve a reduction in working clearances for low voltage systems. Now, this can commonly apply to mechanical controls for fire dampers and VAV boxes located above a ceiling, where maintaining the condition one of three foot zero inches can be difficult. NEC Exhibit 11014 also has an exemption for existing buildings. And this exemption allows you to apply signage that prohibits exposing live parts on both sides of a workspace. Condition one is that exact situation. So where you have your 151 to 600 volt normal voltage to ground operating condition, a four foot space is required from live parts to live parts. If your existing facility cannot maintain that based on the way it's constructed, there is an exemption that you can use that would allow you to drop to condition two of three foot six inches. A sign shall be placed that's readily visible that would follow ANSI requirements that would allow you to utilize that shorter condition. 
for architectural coordination, we'll move back to Mario. Okay, for, we're going to talk a little bit here about uh, egress doors, uh, personnel doors uh, for equipment uh, that is uh, less than a thousand, less than or equal to a thousand volts, and is greater than 100, uh, 800 amps. The door has to swing uh, in the path of egress, which if it's uh, 25 feet or less from the work clearance space in front of the equipment. Uh, it also has to have panic hardware, listed panic hardware, uh, so that uh, you can easily egress the room and to, to egress the room safely. Uh, for equipment rated greater than 1,000 volts, uh, there's no capacity limit. Uh, if you're within 25 feet of the, the workspace, uh, you would definitely need to make sure that the, the door egresses in, in the path of egress. Here are some uh, IBC, International Billing Code, and uh, the Life Safety Code, and FPA 101 considerations that you need to talk about, think about when you're designing your electrical rooms. On the left side here, uh, we're looking at uh, electrical room on the bottom. Door needs to swing out. Uh, you have to make sure that you have at least half the required width that's required by the building code uh, once the door is in the 90 degree opened space position. And then there's another way that we can do this is uh, by having uh, an inset for the door. And you have the minimum required width plus seven inches. And that's what the building codes require. The, the case on the bottom where you may have that inset, that may definitely affect the size of your room, your layout of your equipment, uh, that type of thing. So you may find out that uh, by, by doing this, you, you may not be able to fit the equipment in the way you anticipated. The other thing is, uh, with the doors swinging out, we may have to make those corridors wider. That could affect the size of the building. Uh, and at that point, you may encroach in what the maximum dimensions are in the building. So you may not be able to put the electrical room into space, or you may have to change the configuration of the electrical room to accommodate the size of this equipment and these door swings. <clears throat> the other considerations for doors are uh, you have to think about the maximum size, uh, the minimum size ship, uh, maximum size ship, shipping splits. Uh, you may want to put in uh, double doors to allow large pieces of equipment to be uh, brought into the room after the room has already been constructed, or or after uh, in the future when you put future equipment in. Another way to handle uh, equipment that's very tall is to put removable transoms above the door. Uh, a third way is to put an extra tall door uh, so that you don't have to remove those transoms that are located above the door. Typically what happens when those are removed uh, after construction, they're never put on properly and they have, we have issues with those. So a lot of, in a, most of the time we go with the, over, the extra tall doors. Uh, a fourth way is to put in uh, an overhead door uh, similar to a garage door. The only issue with these is you have to make sure that uh, you can get it in the fire rating that you need. If you're within so many feet of a property line, you may not be able to get this, uh, this door in the proper fire rating to, to meet the code requirements. <clears throat> Some other architectural uh, coordination issues that we should be considering. Uh, sailing height considerations. For instance, structural beam depths. Typically in an electrical room, we try not to have columns in the middle of the room so that we uh, maintain our minimum clearances per code. But, uh, and because of that, those uh, structural sailing beams become deeper. And so you want to you make sure that uh, you have space for uh, the largest conduit bending radiuses. We want to make sure we have the headroom uh, for the lighting and HVC over the workspace. And also want to make sure that the height of electrical what the height of electrical equipment is to make sure that we maintain those clearances. And the height might change from uh, vendor to vendor. Uh, room fire rating uh, is definitely a function of uh, the equipment voltage and rating, and also the type of equipment that you'd be putting in that room. For instance, if you put dry type transformers, you have one rating. If you put uh, liquid fill transformers, we'd have a completely different rating. Uh, fire protection equipment provided also uh, is a function of what the room uh, will be rated will be rated at. <clears throat> Moving on to structural coordination, uh, what we typically do in uh, 
uh, is coordinate with our structural uh, engineers to make sure that uh, where we have a massive amount of conduits that are stubbing up through the floor, uh, we would have, uh, they would put rebar in. As you see here, we have curved rebar going around the conduit stubbing up. Uh, this way, uh, they maintain the integrity of the slab. And if you look at the back there, they're uh, along the top end of the picture, you would see equipment rails and the, and the equipment pads. That's, that's very uh, critical for a ma uh, mainly switch gear where you have to make sure you have uh, a perfectly aligned uh, piece of equipment so you can draw breakers in and out without them hitting uh, uh, the sides of the cabinet and to be able to move in and out uh, easily. We want to minimize the conduit crossings in the slab, as you see in the top. We want to make sure that the, con uh, the concrete aggregate gets between the conduits to make sure we don't have voids in the, in the slab. And we want to identify slots and uh, openings in the building structures uh, to make sure that we have a way to get our conduits in and out of the building after the walls or the, or the, or the foundations have been poured. Again, we should be considering conduit sleeves and cast in place concrete. That's a way to allow uh, uh, conduits to be installed after the slab has been poured. Or you can do block out windows like you see here where the conduits would, would go in uh, through the openings. In existing walls, we typically would have our, uh, the contractors to uh, do an x-ray of the, of the wall and to identify where the rebar is and to make sure with the core drilling, they miss the rebar. <clears throat> uh, this is a typical uh, detail that we typically would put on the electrical drawings to ensure that there is adequate spacing between the various conduits. Uh, typically, conduits should be three diameters on center and basically uh, centered within the center of the slab to maintain the integrity of that, that slab. Uh, the other thing you should do when you're laying out your electrical equipment, you want to make sure that your, your conduits are, uh, are routed properly so that they're not doing a lot of uh, crossing. So you, you may want to make sure that when you're scheduling your MCCs that you have uh, your breakers or your solders on the appropriate side where the conduit would turn off without crossing over uh, other conduits. <coughs> Rich, up for you. Thank you, Mario. It's also important to note that conduit and elevated slabs may affect the fire rating. So therefore, cost savings seen by running your conduit in the elevated slab could possibly be offset by the need for slicker, thicker slabs or the addition of structural fireproofing. And routing conduit underground can save money and also accelerate a project schedule. It's common for contractors to want to get con conduit under the slab because they get to work on it early, and that way they can install conduit and raceway sooner. However, it's important to note that the electrical selection, the gear selections that you make, can be affected by your intended conduit routing. Some switchgear manufacturers have different orientations of their equipment based on underground or overhead routing. This means that your day one installation can be underground, but it's possible all of your future installations will need to be routed overhead. The designer needs to understand this and take this into consideration for how they plan for the future, how much conduit they run underground day one, and also how much conduit they assign for the future. And the top fed switch gear versus bottom fed switch gear will also affect the number of individual sections that you have, which can have an impact on the overall room size. Mario, to you. Okay, thank you, Rich. Uh, other considerations we need to uh, worry about here is uh, for structural coordination is when you're installing uh, motor control centers or other types of equipment, switch gear, uh, switch boards, you want to make sure that the, the conduit window openings are not being placed over uh, I beams uh, below. For instance, if you're if you see this one here on the left, uh, we're we're putting the uh, the MCC up against the wall. However, it's between the beams, and, you, and you can, if you notice here, the conduits are being uh, would be going right through the beams. <clears throat> uh, so uh, can, the other thing we should consider is structural framing 
the framing may may push you away from the wall, which would result in uh, a lot uh, smaller, uh, which will result in the room uh, becoming larger or not having the clearances in front of the equipment that you may need uh, because of that. So you want to make sure that you coordinate with the structural engineer during design and, and consider uh, columns, beams, and make sure that you maintain the clearances and, and making sure that you're not uh, being obstructed through by uh, I-beams or, or columns. Other uh, structural considerations. Uh, structural design is af affected by the static and dynamic loads. Uh, loads on the floor, the walls, roof, platforms. Uh, the higher the loads go, the more uh, in height they affect the uh, uh, seismic uh, requirements of the, the building structure. Uh, some of the other things that we need to make sure that the electrical engineer does is to Work with the structural engineer, give them the weights for generators, transformers, which are large and heavy, uh, and, and heavy equipment that you would have on the floor or hanging from the ceiling. You may want to hang something from the ceiling, then you find that the ceiling does not have the, the girth to actually support the equipment you want to hang. As a result, you'd be using Unistrut, and it would take up space uh, that you would need for your clearances and you would run into a problem with having adequate uh, clearance. As you see here, there's a generator, uh, generators and rotating machines causing vibration, but it also uh, it could result in uh, having harmonic uh, issues with the building. So you want to make sure you talk with the structural engineers early on, give them the weights, and give them the rotating frequencies. So that could be a problem also, and you want to make sure you coordinate that. Equipment on elevated slabs that are rotating are of particular concern because of that harmonic resonant issue that we were just talking about. Richard? Thank you, Mario. Uh, other structural coordination items to follow back up with that also include anywhere you have imaging equipment that can have some sensitive vibration criteria, you'll want to coordinate that with the equipment vendor. When we're looking at environmental protection, NFPA 99, while it does relate to healthcare facilities, does a very good job of looking at the reliability of an emergency power system and electrical systems in general. NFPA 99 wants us to avoid basements with easy water ingress. And it's important to note that it doesn't just include water from rain. It also includes flooding that could happen as a result of fighting fires. And it could include sewer water backups. And it expects us as designers to locate electrical rooms such that they're not subject to flooding from a variety of different sources. We also want to make sure our emergency generators are located above flood risks and that fuel fills and exhaust piping is above your maximum flood height. That way we ensure that fuel can be delivered even if by boat in the event of a natural disaster. Now depending on where you're located, you might find the need for masonry walls or reinforced structures to help with hurricane prevention, flying debris prevention, tornadoes, all of this stuff exists throughout our country. So you want to know what risks the environment can pose to your electrical system and take, take steps to ensure reliability. And this will affect the placement of the electrical room within the entire building, which is why it's important to coordinate this early on in design. Dust and humidity is always a concern, and electrical rooms and emergency power rooms that have outside ventilation will be bringing in humidity, dust, dirt, and debris. We want to try and protect our electrical equipment, especially the electronic control portions, which might require air handling unit supports, blower coal units, or other ways to provide conditioning for that space that doesn't bring in outside air. Another environmental impact is noise. Now, transformers generate noise that is fairly predictable based on their size and their loading. When we're locating a transformer within a building, we want to be aware of what spaces we're going to be placed around that room. A conference room next to an electrical room with large transformers might not be the best idea. This relates back to our previous slides of coordination, architecturally and structurally. We want to make sure that that's being taken into consideration. From an HVAC standpoint, the ductwork serving a space provides a conduit for noise into other adjacent spaces, and in-line silencers may be required. Generators, of course, produce a tremendous amount of noise. Uh, noise sources for generators include the exhaust system itself, the radiator fan, 
and the engine surface. It's possible to have a remote radiator versus an on-unit mounted radiator, and the location of that is going to have a wide impact on noise as well as the room configuration itself. Mario? Okay, uh, HVAC coordination. We talked about structural and, and architectural. Uh, HVAC coordination is of major concern uh, because the HVAC equipment cannot be installed above uh, the equipment, uh, the dedicated space above the equipment, which extends six feet above the footprint of the equipment. Uh, if you you can you can pro install the, it above if you're above six feet. However, if there are if there's condensation or any leaks or any breaks that could occur, we need to put pins or some some way to protect it to make sure that uh, you don't get that water leaking down on top of the equipment. Uh, the other thing we want to make sure is that we uh, provide space in the room when we lay laying out our equipment to make sure there's areas for openings uh, for ventilation. Uh, thermostats, we don't want to, we want to make sure the thermostats on interior walls, not on exterior walls. And uh, one of the other things we need to do is, especially in, in an industrial environment, we want to consider providing positive pressure uh, ventilation uh, in, in this room with respect to the adjacent room. For instance, if we have a room next to us that has uh, a corrosive gas uh, similar to hydrogen sulfide, which is corrosive to copper, uh, we would want to keep the, this room positive to that uh, to the adjacent room so that we don't get uh, we don't get the infiltration of that gas into the electrical room which will corrode the equipment <clears throat> during the the electrical room layout uh, and the HVAC design we need to provide our HVAC engineers with heat gain calculations uh, on our for our equipment. What I typically do in this case, I have the equipment layout, the electrical equipment layout, and I identify the, the wattages that are uh, giving off by each, each section of the, of the switch gear or MCC. Uh, if there's transformers, uh, they give off quite a bit of heat, so I, you, give, you put those on the drawing suit, and then the HVAC engineer will identify uh, what size uh, equipment would be needed for the room. Uh, Redundant air conditioning systems are typically used for critical facilities. Uh, it could be having a combination of uh, uh, AC units and ventilation coolant, or it could be having redundant air conditioning units. Again, uh, electrical equipment needs to operate at 104 degrees ambient max, so we need to make sure there is, if we're using ventilation, there's enough airflow right into the room to keep the the room uh, ambient down below the 104 ambient. And because of that, you may end up with large exhaust air intakes. Also, working with the plumbing engineer and the fire protection engineers, uh, we need to make sure there's an there's impact on the type of equipment within the, the room. For instance, uh, the fire rating of the room and what type of uh, uh, Suppression techniques will be used, but also dry type transformers uh, rated 112.5 kVA or less uh, must be uh, spaced 12 inches away from combustibles. Uh, you have to make sure that when you're laying out your room that you you account for the space, because once you buy the equipment, you may you may not be able to fit it in the space and, and get access. And there's also access points to the side of the equipment where conduits you typically come in through the side and exit through through the other side. So you need, to, you need to make sure you account for the space when you're laying out your room. And if uh, you have uh, dry type transformers that are rated 112 and a half kVA or higher, the room typically has to be rated for a one hour fire rating. <clears throat> NFPA 13, the standard for installing uh, of sprinkler systems, Section 815.11.2 allows emitting sprinklers in electrical rooms, but the room has, has to be dedicated to electrical equipment only. Only dry type electrical equipment has to be used. For instance, you can't have a liquid-filled transformer. 
The equipment needs to be installed in a two-hour fighter rated room, and there can't be any combustible storage permitted in that room. However, what we typically do in our electrical rooms is we use uh, pre-action type uh, sprinkler systems. Uh, how this actually works is uh, the piping within the room, the sprinkler piping within the room is typically dry. Uh, there's a, two events have to t uh, take place before water is released. The first is either a smoke or heat detector initiates the pre-action valve, which floods the system. And the sprinkler needs to fuse uh, from the heat of the fire before water is released. There are pressure switches that monitor for trouble, flow switches that monitor for system act actuation. Uh, and the reason we put these systems in is typically in an electric room, you would have uh, modifications being made. And during construction, they, you could be uh, a conduit could hit a sprinkle head. And if it wasn't a pre-action system, you would get water leakage or uh, uh, discharge from that sprinkle head. So this is a, a, a nice way to make sure that you do not uh, uh, indulge your, your, your equipment with water because of accidents. <clears throat> Rich, for you. Yep, thank you, Mario. It's also important to note that when we're doing a dry system, uh, we will commonly recommend using galvanized sprinkler piping to prevent rusting, since oxygen and, and water can kind of be the enemy to black steel pipe. Uh, we will also use a dry system for freeze protection in generator rooms or rooms where outside ambient air can be brought in in northern climates. Now, an alternative to using a dry sprinkler system is to use a clean agent fire suppression system. Now, this equipment, as shown in picture, does take up physical floor space within the electrical room. You'll have a space for your tanks, you'll have a manifold, and you'll also have push buttons at the exterior exits to allow operators to withhold the discharge of that equipment. Now, these are typically a momentary push button that are being held as long as it's being held and the system is not discharged. This gives people within the room enough time to fully evacuate. Now, this equipment will also require dedicated detection systems. And it's not uncommon to have still house fire alarm system to provide you an early warning before you have a chance to have a discharge of your clean agent system. And it's important to also coordinate this with HVAC. Uh, the discharge of this equipment may require the use of additional fans and additional HVAC equipment to evacuate that dry agent. Mario? Okay, thank you, Rich. Uh, as you see here in this picture, uh, the, what we typically run into, especially in existing uh, facilities, is we may have rain leaders coming down from the roof. So if you're, if you're looking to put electrical equipment in these rooms, you need to make sure you're aware of the surroundings and, and what plumbing is already in the room. For instance, if, if we were to put electrical equipment in, in this room, we'd have to have our plumbing engineers uh, Move the, move the piping if possible, so that it's not over the equipment. Uh, if, the equip, if the room is tall enough where you're above the dedicated workspace, uh, we put, provide leak protection for the piping. Uh, we would put a pan around it and maybe have a way where the, uh, the water from, from a leak would discharge to a spot where it can be seen and we could fix the issue before it becomes uh, a problem to the equipment. In new installations, we want to make sure we're talking with the plumbing engineers uh, and coordinate where the down uh, spouts would be coming from, down leaders would come from the uh, from the roof, but also where uh, you may have plumbing from uh, rooms above and make sure that we don't uh, have those within the electrical room. The idea is to keep all the plumbing out of the room, especially in a new installation. And you need to do that coordination early on to make sure that that's maintained. Rich? Thank you, Mario. For 2017 NEC, service entrances are addressed by Section 230. The main service disconnects are required to be fed by conductors which are underground or two-hour rated. This impacts the location of the main electrical room because it is expensive to provide two-hour shafts around overhead conduits. Typically, we will see an electrical room located on an exterior wall or at least on a, ground, on a main level on grade to allow for underground conduits. Now, of course, this relates back to 
some of the earlier discussion for flood prevention. So it's important for the engineer to take that into consideration early on in programming and schematic design when that electrical room is being located. Additionally, 23071 sets the maximum number of disconnects. Now, this is a very important thing to understand because what it says is that you can have a maximum of six disconnect or overcurrent protection devices in parallel for a service entrance. Now, to get around this, it's very common to provide one main circuit breaker. And then from downstream of that main circuit breaker, you can have as much as you want. You can see that in this arrangement. However, it's not uncommon to encounter some installations where some cost was saved and no main breaker is provided and instead the six disconnect rule is being used. That's really important to understand this going into a remodel project to identify that up, up ahead of time because adding a main breaker or exceeding, you can't exceed the six disconnects. So if you have to add on, you might be adding a service, you might be adding a main breaker, you might be having more impacts for that facility, which can certainly be a long outage and add cost. NEC 11026 also identifies the minimum working height, so six feet, six and a half feet and higher. This relates back to the architectural coordination previously. Now, it's either six and a half feet or it's the gear. And as Mario mentioned, the height of that room not only has to accommodate the gear and people walking in the room, but also HVAC structure and lighting. So once we've located our electrical room and we've protected it from flooding and we've coordinated with all our other disciplines, we need to know how big to size it. Now what's difficult for many designers early on in a project is to know how big that room needs to be before any other major decisions are being made. This is a programming or a schematic design. One common method to get around this is to reference RS means for watts per square foot for the building, a certain building type. Uh, so you might pick a healthcare facility and it might have five, six, seven watts per square foot for receptacle lighting loads. Now, you're also gonna be referencing the energy code, which is going to determine what your watts per square foot could possibly be for your lighting. From there, you'll identify other main electrical loads, which could be a kitchen, could be the data centers. Data centers, of course, have high power densities. The type of elevator, whether they're traction or hydraulic, the quantity and the rough size. You know, try and get a horsepower number early on. We want to know from a heating standpoint, is it gas, fired, or is it electric? And that includes boilers. It includes reheat boxes throughout the facility. It includes all of your perimeter heating at your exterior windows, whether they can be hydronic or whether they have to be electric. And also whether or not you have humidification that can be required to be electric. And depending on the building, we might need a fire pump and we'll want to have an estimation of that size. Next, we'll need to know from the owner standpoint what they want for electrical gear. Do they want draw out switch gear that can be maintained? Are they okay with molded case breakers and switchboards? Or do they just want panel boards? And sometimes the ampacity of the incoming service is going to determine that. But we want to know that ahead of time because each of those decisions affects the overall gear size. Mario? Okay, thank you, Rich. Uh, electrical room size and considerations. Uh, properly sizing the room based on the electrical load, as Rich was talking about. Uh, for, our, for commercial type buildings, you could do square foot uh, calculations uh, to get load sizes. When you're in industrial installation, uh, you may, you're going to have much larger equipment sizes based on uh, the size of process equipment that you may have. For instance, you may have a 2,500 horsepower motor, and that would increase the size of the, the electrical gear. Uh, when you're laying out these rooms, uh, you may want to take a look at uh, the, the three different types of vendors. For instance, if you have a project where you're, you're required to have uh, three or equal, then you need to make sure that the equipment uh, accommodates the vendor that has the widest piece of gear, and also for the vendor that has the deepest piece of gear and also the height. So you may have to make a, leave a space in the room that will be able to accommodate any combination of those uh, so that when you get the actual uh, vendor's equipment, it will be able to fit in that space. <clears throat> also, you want to make sure you provide space for growth. As you can see in this uh, diagram to the right, uh, there's we typically – uh, would lay equipment out so that you could expand on the on the ends for both the switch gear and for the MCC that you see there. We want to make sure there's space for conduit routing, uh, be able to get 
the, the conduits in and out of the room, and also space for ancillary equipment, such as uh, the switchgear batteries that are up on the uh, top right corner of this room, uh, battery chargers, UPS systems, and station service transformers and panel boards that may be uh, supplying equipment within the room itself. <clears throat> Thank you, Mario. Unit substations kind of combine all of the previous requirements. They're large, they have multiple voltages, so they're going to apply to your medium voltage and your low voltage clearances. The transformers are also physically large and they can affect the fire rating. We also want to make sure that we can get these things in and out of a building. And that's just not the doors entering the room, but it will also be the corridors and the entire path to the exit of the building. Now, emergency power locations are defined in FPA 110 as EPSS, or Emergency Power Supply Systems, or EPS, Emergency Power Supply. Emergency Power Supply Systems, or EPSS, are your equipment, your distribution panels, your transfer switches. While your EPS, or your Emergency Power Supplies, that's the generating equipment, your generators, your flywheel, your battery UPSs. NEC Article 700, 701, 702, and NEC Article 517 are going to determine which branches you have for transfer switches, and that will impact the location and size of your electrical rooms, as well as the separation required. Your EPS rooms, per NFPA 110, identify a maximum of 660 gallons of fuel oil, which is going to drive the size and quantity of the day tanks that you can place in that space. And NFPA 99 is also going to determine the requirement for a two-hour fire rating for the, any equipment containing EPS. Typically, it does allow EPSS equipment, such as transfer switches or panel boards, to be located within the EPS room. It also sets a maximum or minimum temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit to protect freezing, and this kind of goes back to the dry pipe, the sprinkler piping that might be desired. We also want to keep the generator from getting too cold, and we also want to protect it for uh, fire ratings to adjacent, adjacent spaces. Shown here in this photo is an air intake louver. This is bringing in both combustion and cooling air for a generator. I, one of the items that we have to consider when we're laying out our emergency power supply room is the size of this louver, the location of this louver, to provide adequate cooling if the radiator is unit mounted. And at the very minimum, we need to make sure we provide adequate combustion air. And since we're bringing this directly outside, we relate back to our previous slides for noise and dirt, debris, as well as temperature requirements. Illumination is always going to be a concern. And NEC is going to require that we have battery lighting in electrical rooms to supplement the building lighting. We will put this on emergency power whenever that's available or provide battery lights either externally mounted or internally mounted within the light fixture. We want lighting on all sides of our electrical equipment, anywhere there is service space that can be had. One common topic these days is selective coordination and the impact that selective coordination can have on the size, location, and configuration of our distribution equipment. Shown here in the left photo is a, an example of fused distribution equipment. And fused equipment can be a little bit larger. It can take up more physical space. However, it has advantages as it relates to selective coordination. So we're seeing them come back and becoming more popular. On the right-hand side is a distribution panel with molded case breakers, but they have electronic trip, which increases the overall size of the gear, the width of the gear, and adds additional low voltage sections on the side of it. Both of these come into play, and we have to factor this in as well. We can't just assume that we're going to have a nominal 40 or 42 inches for a distribution panel, as we may have in the past. We might have to increase that to 60. All of these, of course, factor in when we're remodeling projects and dealing with existing electrical rooms. It's important for the designer to go back through this presentation and look at all the talking points to identify, does the existing room comply with all current codes, and are we touching it enough that an authority having jurisdiction may want us to make some corrections or simply find a new place for electrical gear. Mario? Thank you, Rich. Uh, finally, here we're going to talk about future provisions for expansion. Uh, what we typically do is if uh, we put a switch gear in, uh, we typically put the main tie mains in the center of the lineup so that you can expand, as you see here, at the ends with the feeder, feeder sections. Uh, we'd, locate the, we'd also want to locate the equipment that's going to be installed in the future based on the master planning for the facility uh, so that it's closest to the door so that you can bring the equipment in without having to uh, go past the, the installed equipment and make it easier for installation. And so, uh, again, I, we want to make sure that we can uh, accommodate the largest uh, shipping splits 
uh, that are required for those types of equipment that we're anticipating in the future. <clears throat> Again, uh, one of the things we do here is uh, for an MCC on the right here, you'll see that we extend the pad and we actually, there's a plate that goes over the, the pad to make sure to allow that in the future, you pull that out and you can bring conduits up through this and stuff up through the, the slab to get into, uh, get into the, the new sections of MCC. And uh, again, uh, install conduit sleeves all blockouts in, in windows for elevated slabs so that you don't have to come in later on and do any core drilling. Okay, let's get to these questions. Mario, the first question goes to you. Could you describe a designs that provide for arc flash protection <coughs> for maintenance workers? Uh, yes, there are, there are actually a number of ways that we can uh, accommodate uh, for arc, arc file protection. Uh, one way is on switch gear or where we put in maintenance switches that uh, change the settings of the protective relays so that there's less incident energy and it reduces the, the arc fault value to the gear while people are working on it. Another method is to have arc fault resistant gear. Uh, the issue with this, the gear is much is much bigger than conventional gear. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a way to uh, exhaust the, the, the gases during an arc fault. So there's usually some kind of a, a ductwork that is uh, uh, attached to this gear. Uh, the other thing that we do is, especially when on double-ended gear, where we have uh, two sources feeding a bus with the main tie main, what we typically do is we actually put in two tie breakers that allows us to isolate completely uh, when there's, we're doing maintenance on one side of the gear so that you can actually still do maintenance on your tie and make sure that side, one side of the gear is completely dead. Uh, another method is to provide a mimic panel remote from the gear where you can actually control the breakers, open and close the breakers uh, and not stand in front of the gear. And uh, an, another thing that we do is put a re remote motor uh, motorized breaker drawer outs for the large uh, um, 480 volt uh, power breakers and the medium voltage uh, drawer out breakers. We don't want people standing in front of uh, the gear while they're drawing out the breaker. Even though the the, the breaker is open, uh, we put the electronic uh, the motorized device on there with the tether that you'll be able to control the breakers, uh, bringing them in and out of the out of the cubicle. So those are a number of ways you can uh, reduce the arc flash issues for maintenance workers. Hey, thank you for that. Okay, Rich, next question goes to you. What can you tell us about how software such as Revit might help in coordination? Certainly. Uh, you know, we've been using Revit for a good number of years now, and we model all of our buildings, all of our various systems within Revit. This allows us during design to coordinate the structural systems, architectural systems, plumbing systems, HVAC, the electrical gear, and the electrical conduit all during design to help minimize some of the issues that we've been having. We also make requirements for coordination drawings to happen before anything is installed. This is a two-tiered method to help ensure and use software to help ensure that we don't run into problems when we actually reach the installation phase of a project. Okay, thank you. Um, Mario, you get the next one. One of our viewers uh, sent in a comment that says, um, I was under the impression that doors in electrical rooms had to swing out, not swing in, as the architectural drawing in your illustration depicted. Is this not true? Could you clarify that? No, you are you're correct. Uh, actual where it says condition one, no onset, that's the electrical room below below. The doors which you see in here, these these that's a corridor. Uh, that's the clear space that you need in the corridor. The electrical room is uh, below the wall, uh, same on the right hand side. That inset is actually going into the electric room, and the corridor is between the two walls. So you, you are correct; it's swinging out, and that's what this depicts. Got it. 
Okay, Rich, next question goes to you. Um, how important is uh, UL list equipment? Uh, NEC section 110.3 uh, subsection C requires a national recognized testing laboratory, uh, which we identify as UL testing. Of course, you don't have to go strictly to UL. There are other recognized testing laboratories. But this section in NEC 110 is what we'll go back to uh, if there's a question about whether or not listing is important and or required. Okay, Mario. Does the six foot wide rule apply to the lighting panel, transformer, receptacle panel combined into the same enclosure? I assume this is the, we're talking about the six foot wide room with 1200 amp uh, gear. If the, if the gear is rated 1200 amps and the, and the total uh, width is six foot or greater, uh, yes, the, 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 the six foot wide rule would apply in this case also. All right, thank you. Rich, you're up. What is fire separation requirements for an engine generator being in the electrical room with other electrical equipment and gear? We'll look to both NFPA 99 section 6.4.1.1.8. I have that handy because it was in my notes. Uh, that states that an EPS shall be installed in a separate room for level one installations. It allows EPSS equipment, which is, of course, your distribution, transfer switches, et cetera, to be permitted to be installed in that room. And that requirement also references back to NFPA 110, section 7.2.1. Uh, the requirement of the two-hour fire rating is also within NFPA 99, and it states that a room shall have a minimum two-hour fire rating or be located in an adequate enclosure outside of the building capable of resisting the entrance of snow, wind, rain, at a maximum velocity required by building codes. And again, that's echoed by NFPA 110, 7.2.1.1. Thank you, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, Mario, is oil type transformer loud in lead buildings? Uh, yes, uh, I'm actually not sure if uh, lead allows oil to be provided in the building. Uh, if it was, if if the transformer is allowed in the building, it would have to be in. Uh, it would have to be in a three-hour rated room, that type of thing. All right. I think that's about all the time we have for questions. So I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, uh, Mario Vicarelio and um, Rich Vedvik, for kindly sharing their time and knowledge. And also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, ASCO Power Technology for Technologies, for sponsoring today's webcast. And now that we're just about done, we want your feedback. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, thanks for attending this webcast. And now this concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.